the, the observatory of public sector innovation are kind of an innovation lab or an innovation team inside this huge kind of a staple of uh, international organization of the OECD. Uh, and OECD has been uh, kind of in charge of development and, and, uh, and international well-being for quite some time, so doing research on this, and has quite ingrained ideas about what the work is or what the expertise in this area is needed. So actually we're challenging the OECD a little bit as well with this kind of work to talk about anticipatory innovation and the future of even international organizations and what their role is within this kind of new and developing environment. And usually it starts off with an idea about to talk about why do we do innovation in the first place. So why we are doing uh, not only anticipatory innovation but why are we innovating at all? So this is probably not the audience to make the case. So this is audience that you, are, you have come here, you have selected to come here to actually talk about a smarter city, about innovation within your organization itself. But I am sure that you can all think about that one colleague, at least that one colleague, who is kind of a skeptic. Also like, if it ain't broke, why fix it? If it isn't really a crisis, why should we be doing this? Like, this is tough work. So this happens also in the private sector and public sector. So not only public sector organizations are afraid of change. Pri private sector organizations are afraid of change as well. So why do we innovate? So for this, we have kind of a strategic uh, model itself about the why, why do we need to think about the innovation in the first place? So maybe sometimes things are working fine. Why to think about the innovation at all? So we start off with uh, the fact of basically four questions that are not linked to innovation itself. And uh, the first question is, do you want to do things better? So that is a fundamental question in the public sector. You always want to become more efficient and more effective. So you always want to enhance. So you always want to do enhancement-oriented innovation. So you always want to make your systems work better than they did before. Secondly, do you have goals and purposes to fill? We wouldn't have politicians if we wouldn't have goals and purposes to fulfill, promises to come up in elections. So for that, you actually need uh, missions and mission-oriented innovation. License for to say, I am going to run on this platform and this purpose and whatever it takes, make it happen. So innovate as much as you can, but make my promise come true. So that is a, another reason why you need innovation. If you come downward is adaptive innovation. So the question is, how can I capture the changes my citizens actually need? So your citizens, as we heard on this day, uh, stage earlier in the, this morning, are doing wonderful and new types of things. And we, as a public sector, or companies as well, are continuously searching ways to actually respond to that. We need to adapt to that. So we need to do adaptive innovation. And last but not least, we also have to do anticipatory innovation because of the question of are we prepared for the risks and uncertainties that are coming up? So how well have you designed your systems? There are new systems and new developments that are coming up that are beyond what your organizations and your systems can deliver at the moment. So we need to actually do anticipatory innovation for all of those reasons. And we need to do it in new and different ways. Because of a very, it's an old example, but it's a very telling example from Honduras of all places. In Honduras, they have a huge problem of hurricanes. So a current hurricane will be the uh, AI or artificial intelligence. But they have a problem with uh, uh, hurricanes. And those hurricanes make a lot of uh, infrastructure collapse. So a hurricane comes through and you have to rebuild all of your infrastructure. So in the 1990s, they decided we are going to gather the best experts in the world to build the best bridge in the world that will stand for any hurricane that comes through our uh, country. And they did exactly that. They got the best experts in the world, the best evidence in the world, and they built uh, the best uh, bridge over Lake Tirhacha, I'm really bad at saying that name, 
but mm -hmm. they built the best bridge over that river. And in 1998, uh, the the mm, very big Hurricane Mitch actually came through the, the country itself. And lo and behold, they were successful. The bridge held. All of the evidence and all of the experts were, uh, were right. They could build the best bridge in the world. But during that hurricane, the river changed its place. So they had the best bridge but unfortunately, it was 20 kilometers from where it was needed. So the reality is that how much evidence and experts you bring together at the table today, the future is going to surprise you. The complexity of different plausible futures is very, very high. So we actually have to learn how to uh, work in a totally new and different ways because I don't think that anybody in this room is, is thinking that their, their work is becoming easier or <laughs> they have to start uh, responding to change you know, at a lower, lower pace, that your work is going to slow down in some way. I at least don't, uh, don't expect that to happen. So that's why we need anticipatory innovation governance. So what are these terms? What does this actually mean? So you hear a lot about anticipation. So anticipation is essentially the act of creating knowledge. So actually, you create knowledge about the plausible futures that might be. So we're not talking about uh, building a scenario of Helsingborg 2030 or Helsingborg 2050. That might be part of the process. But actually thinking about what are the possible plausible futures that may come up in this point in time. And then we uh, actually talk about anticipatory innovation itself, is when we are thinking about those plausible futures and plausible ideas, both positive and negative, that might come up, what are we actually doing about it? So are we taking this information and those plausible futures in the practice itself? So can we test in reality about what this plausible future might look like in practice? And by putting it in practice, we can actually shape the future because we give signals about these are the flying cars we want to see or this is the type of sustainable city we want to actually build. So it's, not, it's actually taking from anticipation a lot of talk and thinking to the action of governing that action itself. And what our team is interested in and the partnership we're building together with the city of Helsingborg is what kind of mechanisms of working do you need in practice within your organizations that you can take that act of anticipating, of creating that knowledge of what might be, and actually taking it in down to the practice itself. So the innovation governance part. So you actually, what do you need in practice to make that innovation happen? and to bring that as a learning loop back into your thinking about dynamically about what type of bridge do I need to build for tomorrow and the next day and the day after to make that adaptable to the evolving situation at hand. And I have to tell you, private sector is not good at that either. So this is a tall order for not only public sector but private sector. We have many stories of companies, big corporations failing, of Nokia's and uh, of, uh, of different examples uh, of uh, corporation actually not doing that exploration process and taking that exploration into practice as well. But we have ambition at the observatory public sector that uh, cities and governments around the world can do this better. That in the next uh, upcoming days, when we take this into action, we are actually going to come up with uh, what this will look like in practice. So we have an actually do plan in place to do this kind of testing of different mechanisms and anticipatory innovation with uh, different cities and uh, government, uh, governments around the world. So this is our action plan uh, of, uh, that we are doing today. We might change it tomorrow before with the evolving situation. So we also will take the anticipatory mindset to actually do this work. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Piret. And I lo love that the, even the tool is adaptive. That's yes. uh, <laughs> sort of telling. Um, I was thinking uh, citizens and governments have always been working with change, working with innovation. And like you mentioned, 
uh, we all have that change resistant colleague uh, and now you have a new way of thinking about innovation could that be challenging uh, or threatening in any way difficult to uh, implement to some uh, absolutely i mean uh if you tell me today that I, I need to change how my team works tomorrow, I will push back too. And I'm a change-oriented uh, person. So, I mean, nobody likes change. We are actually, people in general, humans, uh, try to find patterns. Patterns by how our brains work, because it helps us to categorize this huge amounts of information. Uh, helps us to run away from the tiger that comes from the forest, because we can identify the tiger, that this is the tiger and we need to run. So change is hard for everybody. So even if you say that you want to do something or you doing it, implementing and actually uh, taking it to practice is a hard process. Mm -hmm. And not only the believers, but also the, or also the, the strugglers and the, the believers also need support in doing so. So this support comes from not only the leaders of your organization that have to buy into the processes and give a little bit of coverage uh, to do this type of work, uh, but also about the team mentality and mindset of the people you actually work together with, mm -hmm. about the kind of values you hold dear. So if we can kind of boil it down to this is about doing things better, this is about actually reaching the goals, this is about you know anticipating for the risks and uncertainties of the future or adapting to the needs of the citizen, I didn't need to talk about the innovation at all. I didn't need to talk about change. This is core business. This is what governments should actually do. And if we can change that mindset into that type of thinking, then I think it becomes easier, but you actually need a lot of support uh, from the system to do that work as well. Mm -hmm. Well, and we need to set different expectations on our leadership as well, because mm -hmm. it's natural as humans to not act. There's a lot of bias against it. Uh, because if, if something, if you sit back and you say, huh, that's, there's something happening over there, but I'm gonna wait and see, and that thing happens to you, you get to be the victim and you say okay well now we have a crisis now we're going to act now you know we're in this position of something having been done to us mm -hmm. but if you go out and you act without knowing what the answer is or even what the question might be then it's your fault and you become the villain so by taking action you put yourself in a position of responsibility so there's a natural bias against against doing this kind of work but I think we need to change our expectations of our leadership. We need to change the way we work. We need to ask questions of our leaders that are not, well, why did you, why did you do that? It went, out, went so horribly. But why are you not thinking about these things that happened to us? Or why didn't you do anything? Mm. Exactly. But it's not about only responding. It's about mm -hmm. shaping as well. Mm. Because in the public sector especially, we have the finger on the pulse of a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, and we can see these patterns and weak signals. And if we're not doing anything with that, we know that it will turn into a crisis. And our, our work with, uh, with partners and with governments are to take those weak signals and act. So but it is very difficult to do that because all eyes are on government and the stakes are high. Could you give us an example or two? good one, a bad one, doesn't matter. But it, I mean, it seems like we're talking on a very high level here. Could you, you give us some practical? How do you work with this? Well, one that a lot of us are probably aware of um, was, you know, looking at what social media was, was doing to, um, you know, what, as, not asking the question, what does this do to the way that we um, elect our leaders? Mm -hmm. What does this do to our, um, to our behaviors around voting? Um, and by the time that uh, the CEO of Facebook, for instance, was called before uh, Congress in the United States, the, the cat was out of the bag. It was, it was too late. The impact was already there. So what could have governments done to see what, what, what could this do? Not just how does this help us share cat photos with uh, our, you know, aunts and uncles and, and nephews, but what does this actually do to our, um, our social fabric? These are the questions that we want to explore. Maybe but you I, have some I think other that examples. that is one of the, I think that's the core challenge uh, when we talk about anticipatory innovation is that if you work for, uh, for the people, uh, it's much easier to sell a solution to an existing problem mm -hmm. than to sell an exploration of a possible uh, possibility. 
Yeah. So, so in, in terms of changing, sh shifting from just solving the problems we have to trying to avoid the problems of tomorrow, I think we need to shif shift all the thinking as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it's easy to see an issue in retrospect when Absolutely. it wasn't working. Exactly. But if you made the right decisions, you might not actually see that, it, that you did the right thing. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's scary to hear our leaders saying, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. These are the people that we trust to keep peace in our cities and mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. you know, prepare for things. We, when they say, I don't know, uh, that's, that can be quite uh, off-putting. They might not get re-elected. Tough decisions. Oh. But uh, I mean, what you're talking about here is taking actions around a very uncertain topic. So how do you know what to do? What steps to take and when, in what direction? Right. It mm -hmm. seems like a very open space. Yeah, a lot of the work that we've done with, um, with the model that Pirette showed uh, was to, I it's really a navigation tool for us and a contextualization tool. It helps us have good conversations with government. Uh, because each of those different facets of innovation, so those different kinds of innovation, uh, they require ma many different tools, many different methods, and different approaches. So anticipatory is one of these that really does require something beyond what we, what we have now. And even if we don't know the right solution, uh, do we know the right question? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of problems are not knowing the right question. And you don't need to know even the answer to that in order to act in some cases. Sometimes you need to act in order to show yourself what you don't know. Uh, and that's what we really want to push with uh, the action research program uh, in the next year, uh, in the next two years, is to really push, to provoke the system to see what, what don't we know, what didn't we anticipate, and how do we shift what we're doing to, to make uh, an impact in that. So, for example, I mean, let's make it very concrete. So, art artificial intelligence was mentioned or has been mentioned several times on this stage as well, is that it is an area of huge uncertainty. So, we don't know actually uh, if we actually talk about true artificial intelligence or a kind of a self-directing and self-regulating mind, uh, will, will it ever emerge? Or is it, is it an issue of tomorrow because there are 2,000 people in Seattle in the Microsoft offices and engineers every day working on this problem? Mm -hmm. It might come tomorrow, it might come five years, it might come never. Yeah. So this is the beauty of uncertainty, we don't know. And yet the applications of kind of machine learning and uh, different uh, neural networks, for example, that have been applied, so what we call artificial intelligence now, are having already fundamental effects on the ground. So is actually someone in government uh, analyzing what does this mean for my citizens if these applications are applied? Uh, if I don't know the answer to this question, can I experiment and find out? So how can I find out in partnerships with other firms or otherwise uh, to see how it will influence, for example, mm -hmm. behavior of citizens, uh, behavior in different circumstances, or types of services that might not be even needed? So maybe new solutions are coming up with this artificial intelligence uh, that we can scrap uh, a lot of our existing organizational structures and services as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the reality is that you want to actually start to explore these types of projects on the ground already now. Because once kind of the model is decided or the products have been developed outside, it will happen to you. You will have very little control over it. it it's exactly the example of kind of platform economies as well. Like if you build a platform of Airbnb or, or you have Uber or otherwise and you have millions of users on that platform, no politician from the public sector side is going to, or at least in most countries, is not going to say we don't do that anymore. Yeah. Like uh, it's, it's very difficult to control after the fact. And the same will happen with artificial intelligence as well that uh, a lot of these different things that have many different types of effects on the ground will be decided and developed through the development process itself. So governments actually, actually and cities have to put their skin in the game and start to participate in the process mm -hmm. because there is no other way of, uh, of having an influence about uh, of shaping what these products uh, actually look like otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's so why I said it was the most important innovation game yes. for the cities. Yeah, and that's a very interesting uh, topic you're talking about there, that uh, sort of the public sector doesn't have the full control on this. Mm -hmm. uh, but Mikko, 
uh, I was thinking, what are the different roles between the national government uh, and cities in this, and, and what role sh could or should cities play in the future? The roles, the different roles. I don't know. The well, basically, I think that governments are good, uh, good policy makers. Mm -hmm. So they can they can create policies and they can provide means for both companies and, and public sector to develop and, and try and explore new solutions. I think cities should, I mean, I often make an analogy, uh, the, the old city being the Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, a, a number of experts that decide what the truth is and you can't comment or question. Uh, basically, that's the way you, you, you use the old cities or the old municipality services. Uh, I think that we should more and more look upon a city as a platform, more like a Wikipedia, uh, stepping away from b being in control, opening up the city uh, for citizens and companies and others to develop themselves. So I think if, if we are successful there, we could actually get, because I, I think often as the problem with innovation, especially as anticipatory innovation, is that first of all, we run to the solution too fast. We, don't, we, are, don't, we are not resting in the question to totally understand it. But secondly, we rely too much, we rely too much on our own expertise. And, and uh, I mean, think about it. If, if Ingvar Kamprad, uh, the founder of IKEA, would have been a carpenter, do you think he would he would invented IKEA? Not probably, right? Uh, so we, ne we need those other perspectives in order to find these questions or the or the the question behind the question. So therefore, I need we need to start to think about the city as a platform. Yeah. Instead. So, governments as regulators. Policy makers, as doers or yes, an arena doers, to do things? An arena, more like an yeah. arena, yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking you're working with lots of governments or public sectors all over the world. Do you have any good examples on who's, who's a leader in this? There are different leaders in different things. So uh, nobody is smart <laughs> to the fullest. I, I really don't like the smart label. Because no, it, is. Uh, it doesn't have to be a competition, but exactly. maybe a, a, yeah, an a example. few examples. Uh, so different countries are, are doing different things uh, mm -hmm. better than others. So, uh, for example, the United Kingdom is, is really looking at anticipatory regulation. So different forms of actually through regulation, uh, creating uh, anticipatory innovations, so creating sandboxes and test beds uh, through regulatory means for uh, space innovation or fintech innovation for, for other things. Uh, your neighbors, for example, in Finland have had a four-year experimentation program in government uh, on different levels of government to actually lead uh, to experimentation efforts, this anticipatory innovation uh, uh, type of activities itself to look at different um, very core questions of government and run experiments around mm -hmm. that. And we have, of course, you know, forerunners in Singapore or otherwise who are continuously des testing on different modes and methods on how to structure this work. Um, so, but there is no kind of one full way of, of doing it because different organizations and governments also are very, very different uh, in their makeup. So we have also great cities that are, are leading on this work as well. But we don't have the full model or the full kind of mecha mechanisms on how to do it well. Do you agree, Angela? Do you actually have a ranking list? Well, you know, there are certain sectors within, uh, certain areas within public sector that mm -hmm. uh, do this better than others or more than others. One of those is defense. Uh, so there's nothing like an existential threat to your existence as a nation that helps you think about the future. So defense sectors are really investing in these kind of anticipatory mechanisms, but how do we do that with everything else, for uh, everything that affects our well-being, our sustainability? Uh, how can we have that without a crisis or the potential of a crisis? Uh, so that's kind of our prompt for for national level governments, which we work with most often, uh, but we have the benefit of also working with cities. Uh, and I've worked for municipalities uh, previous to OECD, and that's actually most interesting for me, mm -hmm. because cities get things done. Mm -hmm. um, they know how to, you know, act on the ground and create this kind of platform uh, much better and quicker, uh, in my opinion, than than national level. Uh, but I think there needs to be also a dialogue if this an anticipatory innovation governance is going to take place. So it's one thing to do a cool experiment in one city for five years, and but 
after a few years, that'll be a once upon a time, oh, that, that mm. cool thing happened. But is it possible to take models from a local level and sort of push them up to a national level? Or is it always well you know, yeah. place-based or situation-based? That's what we're trying to figure out. So you, you can't exactly trans, you can't replicate no. a lot of this work, but you can't transfer if you associate the knowledge with the context in which it was produced. Mm. So that's a really different kind of learning. This is not even kind of the Britannic Encyclopedia mm. Britannica kind of learning. This is on the ground working knowledge of what it takes. And that's really the interesting knowledge for us to look at with cities. Um, and I think there are different ways we need to think about of how that uh, knowledge gets transferred. Mm -hmm. And we need to share that knowledge with the uh, national level. So one of our other uh, partners in this uh, program is uh, actually the national government of Sweden. So we're looking at how do we take knowledge learned at the city level? Maybe there are legal barriers, maybe there are things that are preventing uh, some things from happening. And how do we share that uh, with national level so they can rethink how they're shaping their own government from, from inside? Well, one of the kind of anticipatory questions in this area might be that, is it actually this national local divide, is it necessary? Is it relevant? Is it relevant? Is that what you're asking? Uh, yes, because I mean, technology is doing interesting things. I yeah. mean, it's doing very contradictory things, actually. So it allows this peer-to-peer -peer interaction mm -hmm. and personalization of services and on the ground very much. So a more decentralized world, uh, more, more decentralized, decentralized solutions. Yes, exactly. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's also allowing for extreme centralization of data. So interoperability of data allows you to have a one se a data center where all of your kind of simulations and real-time observations can happen. Mm. So you actually are centralizing your decision points. So you are, you're going in two very different directions because the actual technology allows, that, allows it. So decentralization versus centralization. Mm. So it might also kind of uh, bring forward a totally different new model about uh, what does local or city government actually mean. And is somebody testing that? And that's a very good hand over here to Mikko. So um, what does anticipatory innovation look like in Helsingborg? And are we centralizing or decentralizing? Uh, well, I think that, that uh, the H22 initiative is a good example of anticipatory innovation. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, what we are asking, we are asking the question is that how should we plan and build our cities so that both the people and planet can thrive? Uh, and under that question, there are a number of different questions. Uh, we are not, we, we don't have any, or we have some, but we have not that much, uh, not that many solutions yet. And those solutions, <coughs> that, or those questions that we ask, the solutions we are looking for, that, that's, uh, that's something we want to do with other cities and the partners, the companies we have within the collaboration. So I think that the H22 initiative is a perfect example of how you can organize anticipatory innovation uh, from a city perspective, opening up the city, as a test bed, as yeah. a discussion forum, as trying to find the, the right questions. So they didn't want to name anyone. Mm. Do you want to name someone who's inspiring us? In we city? had Amsterdam on stage yeah, uh, before. Uh, inspiring, very inspiring. I think Umeå in Sweden is doing some interesting stuff. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, interesting stuff going on in Bristol. Uh, Austin, your own hometown, has done some really cool stuff. So there are so many things, so many cities and places and, and countries that do interesting stuff. But as I Pirette says, there's, there's no one doing everything no. in a perfect way. I don't think there's a perfect way, but we should strive for the perfect consistently and continuously. Mm -hmm. But there's no, nothing that's perfect. So talk about risk here. So this is all, we're talking about uncertainty here. We're mm -hmm. talking moving into the unknown. How do you approach risk when working with this? Pira, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, for sure. It's, it's one of the most uh, fundamental questions that also comes up with doing innovation work in general. So how do I deal with the risk itself? Uh, but my question is, I flip the question usually, is like also calculate the risk of doing nothing. So the opportunity cost of doing nothing. Or doing the same as you always uh, do. Always, uh, yeah, continuing yeah. doing the same as you did before. And especially in this anticipatory space, uh, Having Mark Zuckerberg in front of the Congressional Committee is damn embarrassing. 
And it, if you lose, uh, if you have tampered elections, it's also damn embarrassing or even hurtful for your democracy. So how do you calculate those costs? Mm. So if you talk about the risk or the, uh, like the probability of something uh, going wrong, mm -hmm. uh, also calculate the risk of continuing with the same model. And then you can actually start to say, like, is it worth doing nothing? And which would actually uh, deliver uh, more pain to me? Because what I can guarantee for sure, and you know, I don't want to name names, but what I can guarantee for sure that is proven by history so far is that things are going to change. Mm. Like, ain't going to stay the same. Things are going to change. Yeah. So that, that's kind of a different mentality of uh, looking at uh, risk as well. Well, and everybody asks us, because we're OECD, what are the indicators? What should I be putting in place so that I can put it in our five-year plan and we can do anticipatory? And that's a real challenge for this particular kind of, of innovation, because mm -hmm. we don't know. <laughs> if you think you know the right indicators, it means you're not asking the right questions. <laughs> then it's not anticipatory. It's not anticipatory. No, no I mean, you, you just mentioned uh, um, calculating the cost of uh, failure, but could you calculate the cost of success? The cost of success? Mm. Oh, sorry, the no? <laughs> interesting, <laughs> uh, interesting thought. <laughs> I have to <laughs> contemplate <laughs> on that one. <laughs> yes, maybe. I, I don't <laughs> know, I th in retrospect, I think you can. But yep. the problem is if you ask a question in advance. Of course, yep. then it's not anticipatory yep. either, I guess. No. Mm -hmm. uh, but could you use that when you have a result? Could you use that as leverage for sort of continuing the same uh, type of thinking, the same type of strategy? That's one of the questions that we're going to explore. Mm. Because a lot of okay. what we've learned from a lot of innovation labs, which are sequestered areas in a little part of government that get to do whatever they want, mm. uh, one of the challenges with that is they need to produce a lot of quick wins in order to prove their worth, in order to keep getting budget. Now, if you are produce, if you're exploring things that interrogate or disrupt the values of your current organization, the fundamental operational model of your government, well, that's not going to help you get funding either. No. <laughs> so, one of the questions that we're we're looking at as part of this project is how do you make that balance? How do you uh, make sure that you're asking those right those anticipatory questions, uh, but you're also maintaining the, the space or the capability beyond uh, you know, a political cycle or someone who really has their pet project and then it, it kind of lives and dies. So that's the governance piece. That's how do you create consistent space? Mm -hmm. Because it's not enough to have anticipatory knowledge. It's not enough to have anticipatory innovation projects. It's how do you have the governance mm -hmm. to continuously sustain that space. And that's really, really, really hard. And nobody's doing that. No, you can't apply short-term thinking on long-term initiatives. Yes. Yeah. No. That's the problem. No. I, okay. I would also uh, add in a sense that that's why I also started with the full model of how we co conceptualize innovation. And in, uh, you have to have different types of innovation. So. I also like the anticipatory space the best. Mm. I am uh, kind of introduced as a pirate, so I like to shink, shink si uh, ships and, <laughs> you know, uh, go out there and, and do disrupt. the radical, disrupt and do the radical things as well. But if you think about the overall city, that you still need to reach your goals mm. and you need to have uh, your ongoing systems to wor work on them better. So you need enhancement, you need missions, you need adaption as well. Uh, but the real, real big question that actually Angela was referring to is how do you have a system that allows that overall portfolio to emerge? Mm. So mm. how do you have these different structures in place that do these different things? Because doing missions or doing uh, enhancement-oriented work is very different from actually doing uh, anticipatory work. Mm. So asking these hard questions and radical questions. You can't put these two people in the two teams in the same room because one is like, I'm going to make this system of education as is today better, and the other one is like, well, well let's get rid of teachers and let's have peer learning in classes and mm. and let's let's you know the, the coffee coffee room conversations are not going to be pleasant. Yeah. You know, they're not going to share sugar, that's for sure. A whole new way of thinking. Yes. Uh, so we're almost at the end here. Um, if there's 
uh, people here in the audience who wants to sort of go back now and implement these new ideas, one question you all get to answer it, you know, what can you sort of give them one sentence, how to be able to use this to bring uh, a better future into being? So let's start over here. Let's start with me, not ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I well, think whoever's ready, if you're yeah, one well of the big I, I can be ready. Uh, I think that that asking, I mean, staying in the question, looking around, see what happens, and actually staying in the question: What does that mean for my organization? Mm. What kinds of different opportunities does that offer for us, uh, or challenges? but staying in the question, not running to the solution too fast. Oh. Okay. And I would add on to that a key question, and this is one that I love to ask during kind of the early stages of, of a project or a process, uh, when things are still being clarified and we don't all have the, even maybe the knowledge to move forward, it's what might we have overlooked or assumed. Mm. So to ask those questions, uh, and to bring in, uh, do I get two things? I'm going to two, two, two things. I want two things as it's well. It's <laughs> <laughs> to bring in <laughs> uh, the, the, ex the experts in their own experience and uh, to not just rely on the, the expertise, but to bring in people, as we were discussing yesterday, uh, who, who maybe know nothing about the situation uh, and get that different perspective because that diversity of thought uh, helps you get beyond your own expert bias. We have that quite a lot at uh, an organization like the OECD. Mm -hmm. So it's it's nice to be uh, disrupted by people asking you know these dumb questions, which are actually really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Pirat, one thing, two things. You have three now. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! <laughs> I, I, no, I, I, just I said one sentence. One. So keep it <laughs> <laughs> keep it short. So <laughs> if you're running a recruitment panel tomorrow to hire someone uh, to the your organization. Do not hire the person who has the perfect answer to how many piano players are there in, uh, in Sweden or how many piano tuners are there in Sweden. Hire the person who says, I don't know, but I'm willing to find out. So I'm actually suggesting to, to hire people and uh, put teams together and hire leaders who are comfortable of saying, uh, I don't know, I don't know the answer to this, but we're willing to actually find out. So find those people who don't pitch you solutions uh, on the go that they think they know, mm -hmm. but actually allow room for innovation and exploration to happen. So the right mindset and staying, formulating the problem, not running too fast to the answers. Mm. Is that a summary of what you were saying? And bringing those that are not experts. Yeah, mm -hmm. with yeah. the right mindset. So thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. Thank, thank you, you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.